All right. Oh, fantastic. Well, welcome, everybody. That's great. I'm here with an uh, almost graduated Maximilian Hart. This is the last official thing that uh, he has to do before we uh, say that he has met the qualifications for the MA program in language and literature at Signum University. Maximilian has done what I think is the first Signum thesis on Ursula K. Le Guin. I don't know if anybody else has done one yet. So anyway, one of the first ones, and I'm very excited about that because we have a Ursula K. Le Guin course in the fall. So before we get started talking about Maximilian's thesis, I would just like to uh, do a little marketing for Signum. We have four courses running this fall. They start on August 30th, and I'm going to put a link in the chat box to send to you all. That does not look like the right link. Let me try that again. I'm going to try that again. Uh, and you can find out more about those four courses. One is a live Ursula Le Guin class. It's the first time that we've run it. and. Then we have uh, the story of the Hobbit. Corey Olson is the lecturer there, the life and times of the English epic and Beowulf in Old English. So four very exciting courses that you can go take a look at. Uh, by the way, I'm the lecturer for the Ursula K. Le Guin class. So, oh, good. Yes, Sarah Brown. I'm looking forward to the Le Guin class as well. But now I wanna talk about Maximilian's thesis and let him tell you guys a little bit about uh, it as well. Um, we're going to have Maximilian introduce his thesis. And then if you have any questions for Maximilian, you can put them in the chat box uh, anytime throughout this presentation. Uh, we'll try to stop and take some of those and I'll ask him for some things as well. Oh, fantastic. All right, so Maximilian, why did you decide to do your thesis on Ursula K. Le Guin? Well, um, it was somewhat accidental, and at first I didn't want to. Also, I apologize if you hear a lawnmower going in the background. Um, I can't hear it. Okay, good. It's it to me. It sounds like it's right outside my door. Um, it, I started off uh, never hearing about Le Guin until I think it's Modern Fantasy Two. In modern Modern Fantasy Two classes, when you read A Wizard of Earthsea. Mm -hmm. And I was assigned my my job in our preceptor session. My job was to look at magic systems in the world, in the fantasy stories that we were reading. And so I had been diligently paying attention to that and came across A Wizard of Earthsea and really liked it because it was super new to me. And it did different, it, it, it was unique among everything we read because the names as magic thing in The Wizard of Earthsea, magic is done through Old Solar or not old solar, wrong world, the old speech, which is a language that is, it's true to, to say the name of the thing is for the thing to come to be and that a thing has a true name. And that was, that was new to me, it's not new to the world. That's very common over the past 3000 years. But the idea that it was a language and names, not just naming a thing, but also that there was a language involved and that it involved dragons and all these things kind of came together and made me very interested. And after the class, I went ahead and read the rest of the books. Um, and when I started about halfway through my journey at Signum, so it's been about five years, five or six years I've been a student, taking a class at a time. Uh, about halfway through that, I started thinking about a thesis and I wanted to do something along the lines of literary roots of Dungeons and Dragons because we're a Signum student, why would you not do a thesis on dragons? This is the place you can do a thesis on dragons. And I, I ended up not doing that and doing this instead because it's kind of the same thing. It's a thesis on dragons. You got the but word dragons in the title I of the thesis, dragons absolutely. The but it's it, more importantly, it was something that I think is new I in all the reading that I did. And there was a lot of it. I didn't find anybody doing this before. And that was kind of appealing that I had a question that I couldn't find an answer to without more work. Um, and that it seemed like it mattered. Um, the way we look at language and the way we look at the world is something that matters deeply. So putting those two together kind of uh, kind of led me to this. That's pretty exciting to do something new that other scholars haven't 
uh, haven't done yet. Um, why don't you um, give us a, a synopsis or a summary of um, your, your thesis question and what you found out? Sure. Um, well, I actually also, I did just send you the link to it for the folks watching at home. I do have um, my thesis uploaded on, on academia.edu with a discussion available to it. So please feel free to poke at it and prod at it and tear it apart because with anything that is it, worthwhile, it's worth, the debate will only make it stronger. And this is something that I think I would like to kind of push forward a little bit and maybe take in and, and turn into an article or a journal or something like that. Um, so if you have critique and comments, absolutely, please join in on that. Um, but in general, I think it, it might even be easier, not easier. When I asked Chris kind of what the, uh, the audience of this was, she told me it was pretty much everybody. Um, so we've got Signum people here and students who are in the middle of it and, and graduates and curious people from wherever and right professors, professors from oh, other institutions are yeah. dropping in and there's so many and and for the students at least it, this is something that I I kind of was curious about was what was what does the process look like and for me the process was an important part of getting to the actual thesis and the thesis question and refining that. So it, it, would that be okay to just to walk through that for a second too? Absolutely, absolutely. Wonderful. Um, so I started, like, like I said, I started with the class and the question that I had started at the beginning of everything was noticing how this old solar, old speech, old speech is very similar to old solar in C.S. Lewis's space trilogy. They both have these languages that are like the, the true language and Sigoy, the like the dragon who speaks the world into being, you know, Aslan is speaking the world into being, and both Lewis and Le Guin kind of have a lot of similarities. And I knew a little bit of the, from the reading that I had started doing just out of interest. I know I knew um, that Lewis is very influenced by Plato and Platonism, uh, and that Le Guin is very influenced by Taoism, and they were very different but had some some interesting similar qualities. And so I kind of started with that. How do Le Guin and Lewis put together in these two worlds? What are they saying about language and the arbitrariness of meaning? Because that's something that, for whatever reason, kind of has bugged me. So I'll admit I started with a little bit of a, a prejudice and academic. Uh, it's a great place to start in research. Honesty that I didn't like where people are like, oh, the words, words just don't have any meaning other than what we just decided they mean. And that, for whatever reason, that rubbed me the wrong way. Um, and I got the sense that, oh, this, you know, these languages kind of address that, that maybe there's not quite that. So I had to do a lot of reading. And so the first step was that, that reading list, which was very daunting. Um, and then getting started on it. And I focused on, on a few areas. First was that Taoism. I knew nothing about Taoism whatsoever before I started reading the Gwen. Um, so I had to kind of dig into that from a from like an academic standpoint and also from Le Guin's standpoint. She published a version, a, sort of a translation. She says it's not a translation, maybe a rendition is the right word. She she publishes a translation, her own edition of the Tao Te Ching, which is the found, a foundational text of Taoism. And it, she calls herself a a um, an inconsistent Taoist. Mm -hmm. And so I had to figure out, okay, here's what Taoism is, and here's what she saw it as, which is almost two, not separate things, but two very distinct things that I had to figure out. I had to do the same thing with Plato, re-going re back to my philosophy days and, and re-educating myself on his work, and then Lewis's conception of it. Um, and then I had to kind of back up and start again from the modern looking at things, um, learning about semiotics and semantics and reading um, Umberto Eco, which was an experience that I would love never to repeat. Um, you've done it. You've done I, it. You've, you've I've done, done your it. Time. I, have, I have turned in my, my, my secondary source report on Eco and I'm done. Um, I, it, Eco's work was 
very helpful to me. And I will say that. Um, that didn't mean I enjoyed it. But it was a dense read. It's, it's, it was it's a, dense a giant read. book and it's a dense read. Yeah. It was a dense and intentionally obtuse read. But it was useful in kind of pointing me towards the things that that rubbed me the wrong way. I was able to put kind of words on it and figure out what it was specifically. So months of reading kind of narrowed things down. I ended up uh, looking at Owen Barfield and he was kind of the first breakthrough for me. Reading Poetic Diction kind of gave a sense of, wait, this, this ancient unity of language from Owen Barfield was kind of a, a door and from there it got a lot easier but that was I think my third or fourth source report so I was pretty late in the in that first semester still not really having a direction or an idea of what I was doing um, and then finding and just reading a bunch of articles and was it um, Chris being our resident librarian wizard was amazing helping find some theses and articles and chapters of books that I didn't know were possible to find um, and then that first draft happened um, and it was okay. It was pretty disjointed. Um, got a lot of feedback from Chris in, in polishing that up. And then uh, Brenton Dickinson posed me a small mountain that was very good. He was my my second reader, um, and it, it it forced me to go back and rethink a lot of things. And it was it was a very busy seven ten days of of hard thought and rewriting a good chunk of some things and going back but eventually i ended up with this thesis um, that i'm presenting and i decided to only focus on one very small thing which is the old speech in this series of books Beautiful is book. presented as something true every time people talk about it that's what they say Every time we see it used, that's what it does. It's an it's an in, like an inherently effective language to say the thing is for the thing to come to happen. Everything has a true name, and that is their true name. But a couple times we're told that dragons can lie in this true speech. Humans cannot lie in this true speech. It's impossible. But dragons can, or so they say. And if they're lying then does not not prove what they're saying. I think that's from uh, Tales of Earthsea. And that was the most interesting thing to me because either the language is true and nobody can lie in it, or it's not. And so like one of these statements has to be funky. It's like this weird paradox. So if the old speech is a true language, then how is it possible for dragons to lie in it? So that became the focus of my thesis and the spoiler answer is that they don't actually lie um and the key that kind of made that possible is that seeing things through the lens of owen barfield's work so to walk through now owen barfield um kind of proposed this idea that language once upon a time ago was unified in that it, it was simultaneously joining the thing with their description of it to see the sun and say the sun now, we know it means like this ball of fire and that it's X billion degrees and that is this far from the earth, like all these scientific things about it and this abstract concept of the sun. But before we abstracted things and that the sun was unified with all the poetic images that we have for the sun, the chariot of fire that goes across the sky, the Lord of light, all these things. And that they were, they were that, that conception of the world, that unified vision of the world was one. And he talks about the ancient unity of language and that that's kind of what, what poetry recaptures is to take one of these things has been disjointed from a word and re, like marry it back together and this in that you're like, oh, that that has always been part of this word like that. This meaning, this poetic, deeper meaning is is there in that word. And he called he, he considered it to be inherent in the word, which kind of flies in the face of kind of modern semiotic understanding that meaning is not inherent in word, is not inherent in words. So he has this idea of the ancient unity of language and that poetry is the key to recapturing that ancient unity. So I started looking at 
Le Guin through this. Um, specifically looking at C.S. Lewis, because the two languages, Old Solar and the Old Speech, in their worlds are close enough that I keep mixing them up today. But in C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy, it's useful to study because there's been a lot more written about that than there has been about Le Guin's Old Speech. And Le Guin read Lewis. Um, she loved Out of the Silent Planet. She did not like the other two books because they got pre too preachy for her, and she couldn't stand it. She's like, I don't know what he's going on about. But she really liked Out of the Silent Planet. She liked his treatment of the other, the the first, she called them like the first real sympathetic Martians we get, it's mm -hmm. the first sympathetic aliens. And so so we know that she read that. She read his, his old solar, and perhaps it could be influenced somehow. Um, we don't know if she read Barfield. We don't. Um, I actually was and able to- And you even contacted one of her children to find I, out, does I she have know. Barfield? I didn't know at the, the time. I just filled in the contact form on her website and then her son <laughs> answered. Um, that that is like, so cool. He didn't that know, is so cool. Yeah, he, he didn't know if, it, if she had read it. He, a poetic diction from Owen Barfield. Um, he didn't remember seeing it on there. So, there, there's no evidence right now that she was familiar with Owen Barfield's work, but she was familiar with C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy and Tolkien's work, both of which kind of take some elements of that. So maybe not directly influenced, but perhaps indirectly influenced. In C.S. Lewis's Space Trilogy, this old solar is that language. And C.S. Lewis was doing this consciously. He says this old solar would be the, the language that kind of best expresses that ancient poetic unity of the universe. And Ransom talks about this. He meets a Harasa and he gets all excited that he's found the form of language, but the Harasa don't, like they didn't make up the language. This is language itself. And he writes in a, in a poem that, um, talking about Mercury, the Lord of language, and we see language itself coming to earth in that hideous strength. Um, so in the, in the space trilogy it really treats a lot with language and what this would look like. So you've got this, this, um, language of unity, this idea that pure language exists and what, like, this is C.S. Lewis's take on what it would look like. And using, um, if those in the audience are familiar with it, Brenton Dickinson's work on kind of uncovering and the the idea of um, this screw tape letters being part of that world in which ransom is the one who discovers the screw tape letters and that they're written in old solar um, from lewis's uh, original handwritten preface to the screw tape letters we have this kind of joining that this is part of this world and it's so uh so close to this ancient unity of language old solar is that the demons in screw tape whenever they reference the enemy they can't help but give him homage to, to capitalize it basically the enemy is always capitalized in the screw tape letters so even as they lie and deceive and they use old solar and bend it to use lewis's words to to bend something to their own ends they still can't really get around the truth of that language so this is kind of what it would look like for Lewis to say, here's a true language and here's what it would look like to, to bend it. Le Guin kind of does something similar. So we, to shift back to Le Guin, her experimentation with this is much more overt. She's saying dragons can lie in the old speech, but it's, it's not, we only ever hear that from humans. We never hear that from a dragon. The dragons that we see in the Earthsea stories are truthful. They they don't lie. They don't necessarily like twist things. And the first time really we really meet a dragon in a Wizard of Earthsea, he's talking to to Ged, and Ged is kind of ready, and he's not looking in the dragon's eyes, and he's ready to hear because dragons will twist the words and, and a maze of mirror words, but it, it seems clear to him and pretty straightforward. So that's kind of the first, like, wait a second, they, we only hear this from human wizards. So in, in my thesis, I kind of dig into that and the idea of um, where, where 
where the meaning of a name comes from. Um, for Lewis, it's kind of in this ideal form outside. And for Le Guin, it's from inside of something, really. The like kind of the the Taoist underpinnings and the the root of being at the center of everything. That's what a name and what a word and where meaning comes from. And then I drag Tolkien in to talk about how names are, are narratives and somebody's name tells the story of who they are. Um, and in uh, in Earthsea, these dragons and they speak in they speak in the old speech. The wizards they speak in old speech when they're doing magic, and we see something called a wizard's eye. And the wizard's uh, eye is mentioned always in reference to the power that a wizard has. A wizard can, with their wizard's eye, see something. Um, Ged notices like this: the pteranon on the floor of this chamber is the pteranon, and this is a power, and he sees it with his wizard's eye. And later on, um, he and his friend Vetch are at the end of the world, and Vetch sees with his wizard's eye ground under the water, and and he's not seeing what Ged is seeing because Ged is presumably a stronger wizard. And so I kind of, in my thesis, make the connection between this wizard's eye and Barfield and this poet's eye, um, which is a term I kind of had to invent to make it not terrible. The idea that a poet sees this ancient unity and names it, and the wizards, that is the root of their magic. They see that this thing is a, a tulk, a rock and they name it in the old speech. And the more, the, the stronger the capacity for this recognition of a thing's true name and true nature, the stronger the wizard. So the dragons ultimately end up being in every situation that we see them in, stronger than the wizards for the most part, that they can immediately see and recognize the true nature of something. Um, Yavald sees that, Ged's shadow is chasing him. Um, Kalasin names Tehanu and Tehanu names Kalasin immediately. These dragons can see immediately things that Ogion would take a, a, a season to, to study and, and listen to and with all of his senses. Um, and so when a dragon speaks in the old speech, my, my thesis and my, my basic premise and conclusion is that when they're speaking, it's not necessarily that they're lying. They're speaking in a, in a way that encompasses the full nature of a thing, that when a dragon names something, they're using the old speech that in that name and that narrative encompasses every aspect of that thing that a human wizard wouldn't necessarily know. And so a dragon lying might not be a dragon lying. It may well be just a dragon actually knowing what's going on and the, and the human wizard not necessarily being able to see or have the capacity for poetry that entails that. This was very, very similar, depressingly similar to a thesis, a doctoral thesis I read from Shezra Kamran, um, which I believe was the University of Edinburgh. But she has as her premise for kind of explaining this paradox that the dragons have a better imagination than the human wizards. And so they can imagine that these words mean something else and that they can be twisted. And so they can twist them where the human wizards can't imagine them being anything other than rigidly true. And so they're not for those wizards. So it took a while and some figuring out to figure out, okay, well, not quite. Instead of imagination being the difference, it's a capacity for poetry. And that the important part is that it, that allows the old speech to still be true. So it's not, you know, bland imagination, true and super imagination. It's true and then poetically true. So dragons end up being the supreme poets of Earthsea. Yes. And their lies aren't necessarily lies after all. They end up being something that us uh, us humans, or at least the humans of Earthsea, 
uh, might just have a hard time seeing, but not always. For, for some, like Geb or Tahanu, it's perfectly clear and they understand everything. So that is basically yeah. my thesis, is that the dragons of, of Earthsea don't lie after all. I, I remember Le Guin saying in one of her essays uh, when she was talking about truth and 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 reality that you know she might be talking about something that's not real but it's true in a poetic sense and that's what her literature does that's what her her short stories and her novels and her poetry do is right. they talk about truths which might be in a fantasy in, world they might be in a sci-fi world but they're true she plays with that a lot because she actually talks about how she tells lies for a living mm -hmm. but that's but when they're not really lies. lies for a living they're yes they're stories but they're they're not lies breathe through silver um, right they have they have an ultimate truth at the at the root of them even if they're not real yes so that's yeah. kind of the uh the, the approach and the idea that i took well i thought it was really exciting when you made this breakthrough that um that you had seen something that other folks hadn't seen and you figured out how this paradox could be true and it wasn't just something that Paula Gwynn made a mistake I mean she she probably planned all of this out and it works um it works out that humans think dragons are lying but the dragons aren't actually lying I have a couple questions sure um Sara Brown wants to know where Tolkien and Le Guin diverge in their construction and implementation of language in their narratives did you get uh into any of Tolkien's language construction I didn't get into his language construction in terms of his like constructed languages. Um, I think Le Guin doesn't do as much in Earthsea with the, constructing the language itself. We see bits and pieces. We see kind of things like snippets. She does a lot more work in oh, one of her other books. I think I think she does a fair amount of work in some of her Hainish stories on the languages of that world. Um, Always coming home has some language construction as well. That's the one. And and in um in an essay she talks about how she very much likes Tolkien's essay um, on the creation of languages. I think he's like a, a shameful vice or something. I can't remember the name of Tolkien. Secret vice. Yeah. The secret yeah. vice. She loved that essay. Um, and she I think had. Fun, but her her focus is on the sounds of words in particular, like li the literal way they sounded. Um, I didn't focus too much on the constructed language aspect of that, kind of the the intersection between Tolkien and Le Guin is the idea of names as narratives. Um, and in my thesis, I used uh, Elizabeth Broadwell's, I think that might not be the name. Um, but I, there was somebody who wrote an, an excellent kind of analysis of the names of, of Turin as narrative that encompasses different parts of Turin's journey. And each name has this element to it. And that's how, you know, his story is told is through the names that he has and is given and claims for himself. And you see the same thing with Aragorn as well. Um, all the names that he has each kind of encompass a part of his person that, the place where I think Le Guin and Tolkien really differ in that regards is that for Tolkien, it would be say, okay, well, what's Aragorn's true name? Well, we in Aragorn, but that that's just, that's the first name he has. Is there one name that tells the entirety of Aragorn's story? Right, Estelle, Elisar. Each tell a part. Mm -hmm. But for, for Le Guin, I think, kind of what she was getting at with this old speech is that there is a name, one name that tells the entire narrative of someone or something. So I think that is kind of the the part where they branch off and take their own direction aside from the invented language category in which they differed completely. I've always wanted a wizard to walk up to me and tell me what my true name is. Uh -huh. I think I might be afraid to not like it. I'm still waiting. It's like your true name is Babington. All right. That, if that's what it is, that's <laughs> what it is. Hey, I've got a couple other questions for you. Um, Matthew DeForest says he has more of a comment than a question. 
Sure. One you may be able to respond to um, better than I. One way to defend oneself from truth that one does not like is to label it a lie. The thought that the dragons of Earthsea would be telling a larger, more whole truth than the wizard would be like to acknowledge uh, is a damning statement for humans' capacity for handling truths we don't like. Absolutely. <laughs> Matthew, we are living that right now. And and I think a good portion of the second trilogy, the, the last six books, is taking the wizard's knowledge that is can, like canonical and never questioned for the first three books and poking at it and prodding at it. And that's why I was kind of surprised that in the fifth book of the series, she doubles down on this statement that dragons can lie, or so the dragons say. So it, it, she she makes a point throughout those books to not trust authors. She says it very explicitly at one point, like never to trust an author or never to trust her writer. Like she basically says, don't trust what I'm saying in these books, and that she's kind of undermining that idea. And it would make absolute sense. For sure, if you're if you're a wizard and you're I don't know hanging out with a dragon or something, and you see this thing and you finally learn the name of it, and your dragon buddy comes along and says, "Oh yeah, that's that," it would be exas exasperating. Um, there is also, I think, some work to be done in regards to what this poetic ability and difference has to do with the sundering in the lore of of Earthsea where the dragons and humans once were one and the humans chose language and the, this wizardly capacity and the dragons chose flight <laughs> it's the the choice there is it's not as fleshed out as I would love for it to be but I think there's a lot of work there to be done in terms of how that interacts with this idea that I've presented my thesis here. And maybe I'll do that someday. Uh, Matthew suggests that maybe the dragons of Earthsea can see more than we can or do. I think so. And so they, they maybe not maybe not literally like they can see an extra shade of yellow, but I think they definitely can see more clearly. Well you know when the character Irian comes on the scene, mm -hmm. um, the wizards are like is that really your full name? Is that, that's not everything you are. And she's like, not, I don't know. That's what the witch called me, right? Not all of the wizards though. And this, that was one of the kind of the clues yeah, that some of them. pointed me towards not all wizards eyes are created equal. There's only two that take a second look at her and go, wait a second. Wait a There's second. more going on here. Yeah. There's more here. And then later on when she kind of discovers her own identity and comes back a, bo a book later, she comes down and people see at, at the corner of their eye, something more there than just yeah, she's thing. or Miriam. So she's got a yeah, more aspects of her name. Um, I would like to tell you that Owen Barfield is here today, the grandson, I believe. And he says thanks to Max for his intro and for finding Owen Barfield as the key. Oh, it, it, besides being a delight to read, especially after Echo, um, <laughs> it, he really, it really was, and I had, I'd been, I'd been reading Tolkien and Lewis as long as I can remember, and reading Barfield and his works was, it, it's sort of like the thing that makes everything click, and mm -hmm. makes everything make sense, until like I'd, I'd read the Space Trilogy before, and I knew that this second book was about like a lot of like, language and stuff, and language was a part of it, and then language itself comes to Earth. But it wasn't until after Barfield that I was like, this whole thing's about language. And that's the point of all the stories, one of the points to all the stories. So absolutely, yes. It it was it was very much the breakthrough moment reading. Ransom is not a philologist for nothing. Absolutely. Chris Calkins would like to know in your research, how and where do Plato and the Tao interact, intersect? Sorry. Yeah. Hi, Aunt Chris. Um <laughs> The uh, I kind of went backwards from old solar and the old speech because if there there were both languages that kind of purported to touch on the true essence of a thing, 
and I knew from other reading and reading C.S. Lewis, it's, it's all in Plato, it's all in Plato. So I knew Plato was C.S. Lewis's shtick. And Taoism was Le Guin's thing because she mentions it pretty frequently in her works. Um, all the time, yeah. All, all the time, but pretty frequently. I mean, I don't think we've read, like, I don't think I've read something yet that doesn't mention it somehow from her. Um, so I kind of went backwards to those. And the intersection in them is that they both, and it was actually from C.S. Lewis and his Abolition of Man, where he he pinpoints as the thing that they have in common is that there is an underlying truth, that there is truth. Um, Brenton Dickinson can attest to the fact that I had a hard time not tr getting squirrel with the <laughs> idea of essential truth and and where it is, where it's from and all that in my thesis. And it was very difficult not to go down that rabbit hole, but it's, I mean, it's a rabbit hole that last you many lifetimes. So the the essential intersection with there is that they both claim that there is an un, that there is an ultimate reality that there is ultimate truth for platonism or i guess lewis's conception of platonism and neoplatonism it's in the forms that the underlying truth and reality of something has and takes its source from being itself and from the ultimate form of that object whereas taoism kind of goes the other direction and says this pen that I'm holding in my hand, the ultimate reality of it is to be found in the thing itself. And, and that that is where its meaning and, and source comes from, so that you, you would spend the time to become intimately acquainted with this specific thing, and, and this specific thing is the ultimate truth. So it's, they both kind of circle around. I'm doing the motion with my hand like yin yang. They both circle around to the mm -hmm. same idea that there is essential truth um, and that there is an underlying reality to things. And they they differ in terms of where it comes from. That is the, that's the intersection between the two that I was able to find in relation to what I did. Uh, I'm jumping around a bit. If I don't exactly get to your question, I apologize. I have several in the questions box and I want to get a wide variety from folks, so I'll try to get back to as many as I can. But L'Oreal Barker Brown, hi, says, I love this great insights, Maximilian. Perhaps it is thought the dragons can lie because humans twist the words of bigger truth and then believes the truth, believe the truths are lies because out of our misunderstandings, we twist, twist the truths and so distort them. Sorry that, I don't know why that was a tongue twister, but there you go. It, it absolutely makes sense. If you're a wizard who can't see as much as a dragon, poetically speaking, and you have an interaction with a dragon and they say something that is a maze of mirror words to you that you cannot comprehend, that can't be true because you know what those words mean and they don't mean that. Um, it would make sense. I have, I have a friend um, who says that his daughter is about, she's about six years old. He says she's Drax the Destroyer. Who, who, when he's like, it would go over your head, like nothing goes over my head, I would catch it. He says she's like that. He's like, she doesn't get, um, she doesn't get puns. She doesn't get jokes, poetry, just whoo, it goes over her head. And it would be like a dragon saying like, this is going over your head. And the wizard's like, this dragon's lying to me. Mm -hmm. It would absolutely make sense um, to take that childish example and and push it up to something that after that, then yeah, it would make sense that this story would come down that the dragons can lie. The interesting part for me is that according to Le Guin in the fifth book here is, or so the dragons say, that the dragons say that they can lie in the old speech. And I don't know if that's just invented, made up, if the dragon was just like, sure, yeah, whatever whatever helps your brain not explode, little human wizard. I don't right. Know. Well, I like that child. I, I like that 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 example of the child because the child needs to have enough context to understand different layers of meaning, and they don't have enough life experience yet to get jokes. Jokes rely on context, and you have to have a lot of context before you can find something funny. So we're like the childs to the dragons, probably. The childs, the children, whatever. <laughs> um, Robert Steed has a comment with Taoist thought there is a rich development of linguistic theory especially from 
Zhuang Zi, sorry for my pronunciation, who argues that the meaning of words cannot be pinned down, but that meaning can only effectively be conveyed through imagistic and poetic means. Taoists argue against the school of names that argued for instead precise, logical, one-to-one -one correspondence between word and meaning. Zhuang Zi famously destroys that claim in a variety of colorful and humorous examples. Le Guin was probably at least somewhat aware of this historical debate. Um, perhaps this can complement the Barfield angle. Thank you for that, Robert. I would, I'll admit I did have not read this. I love it though. I want to now. Yes, you do. Um, it would, it would make sense. And I think Le Guin in 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 writing this when she has a word mean a thing and then kind of i think pushes back against that a little bit with this thing with the dragons i think in a way pushes against it the, the sterility of what a language like that must be like and pushes for a poetic understanding of it um looking at it through barfield it, it makes sense in that way but i, I definitely want to um, and I'll be I'll be looking up. Is it Zhuangzi? I think probably. Yeah, I sent I sent the spelling to you. There's there's yeah. the ambitious part of me plans on learning Mandarin so I can read some of this stuff in, in the original. Yep. Why not? You got the thesis done. You can do anything now. Yeah, I have all the time in the world. It's fine. All right. Let me see if I can go back and grab some um, of the questions we didn't get. Uh, Matthew DeForest has a follow-up. The idea that the true name says more about us than we would like fits brilliantly with the naming at the end of the book. At the end of uh, which book? Maybe Tahanu? At the end of Tahanu. Um, she's called Theru, right? For the... called Theru the entire book. Entire book. Mm -hmm. And then at the very end, uh, Excuse me. At the very end, um, Sigoi shows up. Callison shows up and calls her Tahanu. And if you were like, if you had a Drax to the, the destroyer mentality of approaching it, you'd be like, "No, that's Theru. You got it. You right. you got it wrong." Ged and the woman from God. What's her name? This is embarrassing. Oh, sure. It just went out of my head, too, as soon as you asked that question. Oh, my yes, goodness. The, well, Ged, one from the tombs of Atuan. Yes. Yes. Her, 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 I can her, remember everything. Except... Her, oh, my goodness. I should have made a cheat sheet for myself just so that didn't happen. Oh. Um, Helps that they recognize. They recognize oh, Thank Tanar. you, Thank you. Um, They recognize always she has been Tahan. Like they, she recognizes that this is her real name. So it's, it's, I think that's kind of the clearest example of something that could be mistaken as, as a lie, but really is a name that encompasses an entire narrative, so. So how did you was, find was that, Barfield? That's a book that, that, uh, that Matthew was looking at? He was looking at. Oh, Wizard of Earthsea with Ged being the name of the man and his shadow. Oh, the part you don't like about yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think Good call. that also was a, a an indication to me that the whole dragon's eye was in fact a thing and as a poet's eye because as, assuming Yavad would be able to name Ged's shadow to him, that means that when he saw this little wizard coming, he instantly knew his name. Mm -hmm. And he was playing with him, getting me like, getting him to say will you tell me my name and then telling him his name and then winning the fight i think that was the kind of cat and mouse game that yavad was playing is that he knew ged's name he just wanted to trick ged into asking yavad to say ged's name because he had no conception that ged would also know his name um by pure random chance of a guess as opposed to that's ged knowing so. mm -hmm. So Kate Neville has a good, uh, hi Kate, has a good uh, observation. We were talking about children and, and context. 
though with very young children, they often tell stories that they believe or wish were true. So it's difficult to accuse them of outright lying because they yeah. have the capacity to lie. They're just being imaginative. Right. I mean, I, I can attest to the fact that very small children absolutely have the capacity to lie. Um, <laughs> you have a few running around there. I, I got a couple. Um, but, well, one drools and yells, but the other can lie and has starting to figure out that that's a thing, that you can say something that's not existent. But she also knows what pretend is. She She's three. She knows what it means to pretend that something is true. And she'll, she'll like correct, she knows that distinction. So it, yeah, I, I, I absolutely can see that being, being a thing. All right, Sarah Brown would like to know, Sarah Brown would like to know, what was the most significant challenge you faced in your thesis process and how did you overcome it? Moving halfway across the country. In the middle <laughs> of the in the middle of my drafting process. Getting a new um, job. Yeah, it's starting a new job, a couple new jobs, a bunch of different, like just life circumstances dealing with it, I think was honestly the hardest part from a logistical standpoint. I think the hardest part for me was really taking all these different bits and pieces and threads and trying to make some sense out of them. Um, wanting to to talk about wanting to talk about the dragons have this poet's eye and they can see was kind of impossible without talking about barfield and then plato and taoism and some sem semiotics and echo and like all these different pieces and it was the the most difficult part was narrowing that down so many much thanks to chris and brenton who were my first and second readers respectively who really helped push me on that because without it, it it would have been in retrospect right after you finish the draft you're like that's yeah, pretty good but in retrospect <laughs> looking back at it oh my goodness this is a little bit of a mess and i'm i'm secretly afraid that this one is also a mess i don't think it is i think this one's i think my final thesis here is much more uh logically progressing but i really did even with this feel like i had to kind of say something and then you know make progress and then come back to something from earlier and really kind of getting around that just the organizational aspect of the writing itself was oh uh, but that's all the the academic argument is it was is very difficult many bricks make difficult a wall this paper yeah than anything else i've ever written yeah i remember when i got my first draft um of a piece back from berlin flieger was my thesis advisor and how she was just like, no, 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 no. And I was just devastated, right? Like, I think I'm turning in this brilliant um, piece of writing to Verlin and she's like, you are all over the place. You just need to focus, focus. And I carried that through to you as well. We should get bumper stickers or, or put that in the Signum shop. I'm easily academically distracted. There you go, that's the bumper sticker. Absolutely, you wanna write about this all the time. All right, I am looking around at the questions here and we have one, speaking of Brenton Dickinson. It is clear that Le Guin thought about what language does and how old speech can work with deep layers of truth. Le Guin has some earthsea words here or there, but quite a few names and words from the Hainish universe. Did Le Guin have a structure in mind for the words that she used in world building or was it random, um, oral by sound of the year? At one point, she mentions that Hainish itself is derived from the old speech. Somebody, I think, wrote an academic article about this in myth lore? Maybe. Really? It might, it might have been another one. It might have been a, a, a linguistics journal instead. I remember reading about somebody taking the words that they knew that we have from the old speech and looking at them next to the words from the universe that that the world of Earthsea that we have and kind of seeing kind of how they might derive and progressing on this idea further but she makes that she does make that a assertion that it is derived from the old speech um it what's what is the name of it it's not is it hanish it's not hanish 
what's is it hainted what's the name of the language that they all speak oh oh. topic um the language the, the everyday ordinary language it's not kargish that's the other one but it, she does make the assertion right. that it is derived from the old speech but no not no no not the hainish that's the sci-fi world right two different worlds but she yeah. makes the assertion okay. that the ordinary everyday language of earthsea okay is derived from the old speech and i think for her i think the sounds of the words are what mattered she talked about um she, how she came up with languages and she would make sort of like a sound bank of these are the sounds that this culture has and these are the sounds that this language has and she would build words around it until they felt right and from there kind of derive some rules and things like that but for the most part i think she was pretty grammar light especially compared to somebody like tolkien mm -hmm. she, she's yeah. not a philologist she's she had she's names. a storyteller and yeah a poet herself so i think for her it, the primary thing was the sounds of the words Yeah, Brenton doesn't know ecumen. I mean, we were talking about the wrong world. We're t we we're Maximilian focused exclusively on the Earth Sea. Yes, I did. So I... we'll just take the Hainish and put that aside. So much. <laughs> ecumen ecumenish, yeah. Um, Kate says she's going to be sure to go to academia, and it sounds like something you should publish and expand. Thank you, Kate. It's currently open for. Um, I just saw that today. Oh, it's open for comments. It is yes. So, so, oh, Hardick, yeah. Hardick. I've got two Hardicks. Thank yep. you. Starts with an H A. Hardick. Hardick is derived from the old speech. Yes. Oops, I think I just deleted something. I shouldn't. Three Hardicks. Four Hardicks. <laughs> Good you guys. It's hard when you're on the spot to come up with with the uh, with words. Hardick. Okay. <laughs> Sarah Sar feels my pain with with her Lynn and has had the same experience. Brain melt is a thing. Yes, absolutely. So um, how did you come about finding Owen Barfield's poetic diction and deciding to use that as one of your core texts? I mean, Umberto Echo, everybody knows Echo talks about semiotics. And when somebody's going to look at language, of course, you go to Echo. But how did you get to Barfield? I think it might have even been you. We were in a meeting and you were like, you're probably going to want to read Owen Barfield for this one. Good luck. Nobody's ever been able to explain him to me. And I was like, challenge accepted. Oh, accept. that's right. You said challenge accepted. Yeah. That is how we did it. That's all that's, those months that's ago in January. Academic. Yeah. That's the uh, the super highfalutin reason for that one. I said, well, you did explain it to me. You, you, you finally did it. Cool. I wish there was like a better answer, but. It was an academic dare. That's pretty much what it was. Those are the best ones. Those are the best ones. All right. Let's see where where we are. Um, so you've talked about some of your major critical uh, resources were Barfield, Echo, and that uh, master's thesis. I think it was from Qumran. A doctoral thesis. Doctoral yeah. doctoral thesis from Qumran, um, which is free online. It was. We, f we found that free online. What other things did you read? Um, oh, good heavens. <laughs> I read, uh, if, if I had like a credits section for this thesis, I mean, at the top would be, you know, God, my wife, whose patience over the last five years has been legendary. Um, but Zotero, right after that, because Good heavens, there were so many different things to keep track of. Um, I spent a lot of time trawling through the the myth lore, like the list of all the articles that have been published in myth lore, finding everything that I could in myth lore, and then a lot of time going down works cited rabbit holes. Um, there was a fair few things that I read. I know I read um, something from, from Verlin Flieger, and the the only note that I had taken for it when I first found it in my reading list was use this work cited because there were so many things in it were just the title. I was like, that'll be useful. Yeah, that'll be useful. So I, I read a lot of academic 
journal articles because I was at the beginning, especially focused not just on Le Guin. So I was reading everything on Le Guin and Earthsea and magic and dragons and names and old speech that I could find, but also I was reading everything I could find on the old speech or the old solar in C.S. Lewis. And then do, does language have inherent meaning in diving down those holes and all the work cited? So it was, I spent way more time reading academic articles than I did books. I think there was only the four or five books, <coughs> the primary texts from both authors that I read. It was primarily academic articles. And there were a lot more <laughs> than, uh, than made it into the, uh, the actual final thesis itself and, and its work cited. If anybody is interested, I would be able to get you like a, a list of all the stuff that I did read throughout the process of it. Cause that's, that's a nice Zotero export button away. Yeah, because in addition to what you walk out with, right, it's a thesis. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that are interested in the process itself. Right. And, and you just start with this really wide, we, we talked about like the big net, the wide net. And everything goes into the wide net. And then, you know, you just have to start making the net smaller and smaller and smaller. Yep. Um, hopefully you can come back to some of that every stuff. Book. Every single, every, everything I wrote, I put, you know, my notes down and then added in Zotero and like, this is what I'm going to use and quotes here and this there as I was going. It was so much easier to do an annotated bibliography doing it as I went from the very beginning, taking notes on each source, pulling the quotes out and putting the page numbers in for things that I might use. So that way I could just, what was that one quote and that one thing? And then just search for the quote for the phrase that I knew that was somewhere in one of the things that I read, search for that phrase and have it pop up without having to open up everything. So I- And that I, was in Zotero? That was in Zotero. You can add a note. So what I, would, what I did, Zotero tutorial for each, for each source, I created a note underneath or in the, I've created a note under each source and then quotes and things like that. And my thoughts, I just put in that note and the quotes had page numbers and whatnot. So that way, if I needed to, what was, what was the one quote where she says this? And I don't remember who it was. I could just type that in the search bar and it would highlight the note that it was in and then I could find it in the actual thing. So yeah, I often remember like one word Yep. and it's like, what was that quote with that word in it? Mm -hmm. And it made it a lot easier too, to find exactly that because you could do keywords like this this article is about this or that and input keywords in for things so to make it easier to, to back search so zotero definitely was immensely helpful in addition to zotero what's one other piece of advice that you would give to people starting a master's thesis or a large research project It's never as easy to, or hmm, it's never as hard to start over as it feels. Um, I really did have to, I, I, in my brain, I still call it Brenton's mountain because mm -hmm. it was like, it was, it, it felt like a complete mountain. He got back to me with just the paper was, would have been bleeding if it was red ink on so many ideas and topics. And I think there's part of it too was, take, you know, Brenton going on a, an academic rabbit hole too. And like, well, but this is a cool idea that I ended up not using at all, but it was definitely, he definitely challenged me to, to focus more. And it was horrifying, <laughs> the idea of having to do that, but it ended up not being as much work as I thought it was. Um, partially and it made your, it made your thesis. A lot better. It, part of it was because I'd already done a lot of the thinking. I just had to figure out how to organize it. Um, so yeah, I'd say the the one piece of advice for other writers in my shoes that I'm leaving is that it's it's worth it to to do rewrites and to take a few steps back and to reorganize and shuffle things and take the time to make it good. Well, thank you. Uh, Brenton has sent in his apology and would <laughs> like you to know that the ink was not red, but green and not. purple, if that yes. makes you feel any better. I think the the uh, word comment ink came up green and purple. And second reader PTSD. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, 
we have come to the top of the hour and I want to congratulate you, Maximilian, on successfully completing your master's thesis. And mm -hmm. that was the last thing you needed to do. Hooray. To fulfill all the qualifications of your MA in language and literature at Signum. So wherever you are in the world listening to this now, applause, thunderous applause. Yay! I'm getting lots of congratulations from around the world, literally from around the world for you. You have worldwide acclaim now. The saddest part of this is that I can't see any of that. I can't. It's see. lovely. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of lovely folks. Okay. Again, if you, again, your question um, didn't get answered, um, yes. go over to academia.edu and look up Maximilian Hart. And uh, do they have uh, a, comments a link or questions? For that discussion there as well? I did not uh, put that in there. I saw that today. Okay. I don't know if you can. I will see that if you're you. interested in. Um, I will send it to you, and then you can send it to the chat. Okay. And, that is uh, directly to the to the to the discussion on this on academia.edu. And then, if you're interested in finding out more about our fall classes um, on Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time, Eastern Daylight Time, we have a panel of uh, upcoming lecturers and preceptors that will talk about the fall classes. You can go to our um, signumuniversity.org page and look for the fall courses 2021 preview and sign up for that free uh, one hour chat among lecturers and preceptors and yeah that went to all the oh no that just went to the organizers and panelists I will send that link to everyone in the entire audience that's the link to um, Maximilian's thesis and or the version that's that's on there now someday hopefully will be a journal or journal article or chapter Thank you everybody for coming today. It was really appreciate it. Um, and uh, thank you for peppering Maximilian with some very challenging questions as well. Enjoy your day and uh, or evening or wherever it is. And congratulations, Maximilian. It's been a great journey. I'm really proud of you. Thank you. Thank you. There thank you, you go. Bye folks. <laughs>